the pressers. Our text or the theme for 2018 has to do with recognizing, please hear me on this, recognizing the value of a thing. It has to do with seeing a thing for what it truly is. I said one time years ago that people who, who do not value their souls do not value the preacher. They don't value the church. They don't value time with God because they don't value their souls. They value their hair. They value their teeth. They worship success. They worship at the altars of entertainment and sports. They value professional achievements and lofty titles. They value educational um, achievements. But they don't even think about whether or not they're going to heaven. Doesn't cross their minds as to whether or not they are actually pleasing God. Well, people who have no thought on these things have no use for church, have no use for the minister. It doesn't, it very, it doesn't cross their minds. And they don't see that what life is really all about is about serving the Lord. Tonight's theme is about recognizing and prioritizing our relationship with the God of the Bible, and listen to this, with biblical Christianity. Biblical Christianity. And some, God bless Dr. Hill. Pastor Hill, good to see you, man. You're welcome to come up if you would like. It's so good to see you. Um, there are movements out now, movements. Um, they won't last long, they never do. The latest, the flavor of the month now is the new, I guess, the woke movement, stay woke. And there are those who are now in other movements that uh, demean Jesus Christ, the movements that come and try to uh, strike at the heart of what we believe. I, I, I chuckle at these movements because I think to myself, we've had much greater competition than you down through the years. And in six months or so or another year or so, you will have fizzled out and people will still be giving honor to God and to the Lord Jesus Christ. And they will still be calling his name. For he said, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But what's sad is the people who get caught up in these movements, they end up out of the ark of safety. They themselves end up lost, but God's truth keeps marching on. I don't want you to miss what the Lord has for you. God doesn't want you to miss what the Lord has for you. In 2018, only those who truly value their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ to the point that they value it above all other relationships in their lives will remain on fire for the Lord and will receive, hear me prophetically, all that God has for them. Can I repeat that? Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. In 2018, Glory. those who value their relationship yeah. with the God of the Bible and biblical Christianity above all other relationships, because our lives are complex. We have multiple relationships. The prophet has said it earlier uh, last, this week about getting rid of the gods in our lives. Amen. And when I was hearing her preach, you know, this was prepared and done uh, before she arrived. And I said, look at that word of confirmation. I said, tell, the Lord told me, I said, tell my people, those who love me above all else, 
will receive from me and will get what I have for them. And also, you will stay on fire. Do you know that you can be revived in a state of revival for the rest of your days? The Lord told me early in my life, he said, Patrick, the revival doesn't have to end. He says, I can keep you revived in me for a lifetime where you enjoy service, you enjoy uh, serving me and worshiping me, and it doesn't take much to get you on your feet. I can keep you in a state of revival. I can look back over my life and down through the years, and I celebrated my 40th birthday in Christ, the 19th of November of this year. I can look back over my life, and yes, like you, I've had... Uh, some good days, I've had some bad days, I've had, had ups and downs, but I tell you, I've been revived. And I have been in a place where it seems like church and being in the house of God, being with the saints, have always been a place that brought joy to my soul and have kept the fires of the Lord burning on the inside. I've often said this and Please follow me tonight. We're going to lay hands on everybody. I wish I would have coined this phrase, but I didn't. But it's one that uh, uh, I will repeatedly say, and it is this. Salvation is not for the passive. It's for the desperate. Those who are passive about whether or not you serve the Lord have no passion I don't know. I'll serve him or not. I'll get there. Maybe I will. Maybe I won't. It's not for you. You have to be desperate. You have to really want this. And as we near the coming of the Lord, you got to really want it that much more. You got to resist what the world is trying to do. From technological advances to what we see on television to what we even hear from one another. The world is trying to cut down and minimize our time with God. Yes. To the point that in many sermons, even amongst preachers, we almost preach against, not against Satan, not against the club, not against wickedness, not against drugs, but sometimes preachers preach against going to church. We behave as though the service is our enemy. We give the workplace 40 hours. And though the areas of recreation, almost 40. And even the average uh, holiness church goer may spend, when you add it up, maybe 10 hours a week. How did becoming, being in God's presence become detrimental? How has that become our enemy. And we drive past soccer fields now on Sunday morning and we see kids out playing soccer. More and more programming now starts at 11 a.m. on Sunday morning. Sports shows, 11 a.m. on Sunday morning. I remember, and I'm not that old, when that was a sacred time. And very little programming would be on that time. And now they march, they have uh, drives, and they do walks to cure this disease and that disease, disease on Sunday morning. And I see their efforts, and I say, Lord, they'll never achieve their goal. No matter how much money they raise, they'll never achieve their goal because they're doing it at the expense of the Lord. On the Lord's day. Are you with me? Let me put it to you this way. In 2018, you will have to really want to stay saved. To stay saved. But for those who really want this, we are going to see, and I'm including myself, a move of God like we have not seen it before. If I be a man of God, my words will come to pass. For those who want to see his glory, you will see his glory. For those who are nonchalant about his glory, you won't see it. 
Praise the Lord. On the night of April the 18th, 1775, hundreds of British troops set off from Boston toward Concord, Massachusetts in order to seize weapons and ammunition stockpiled by American colonialists. And uh, early the next morning, the British reached Lexington, where approximately 70 Minutemen had gathered on the village green. Someone suddenly fired a shot. It's not, it's uncertain which side. And a melee ensued. And when the brief clash ended, eight Americans lay dead and at least an equal amount were injured while only one red coat, only one British soldier was wounded. The British continued on to nearby Concord. I'm headed somewhere. Where that same day they encountered armed resistance from a group of patriots at the town's North Bridge. Gunfire was exchanged, leaving two colonialists and three redcoats dead. Afterwards, the British retreated back to Boston skirmishing with colonial militiamen along the way and suffering a number of casualties. The Revolutionary War had begun. The incident at the North Bridge later was memorialized by the poet Ralph Waldo Emerson. In 1837, he wrote a poem called Concord Hymn. He called that shot a shot heard around the world. But five years prior to that shot, there was another shot heard around the world. Crispus Addux is thought to have been born around 1723 in Farmingham, Massachusetts. His father was a slave, and his mother was a Nantucket Indian. In 1750, Ad in the Boston Gazette sought to recover a runaway slave named Crispus. The Gazette spelled it C-R-I-S-P-A-S. His name was spelled C-R-I-S-P-U-S. It is thought that the uh, Gazette was talking about the same man. But the thing that is definitely known about Addux is that he was the first to fall during the Boston Massacre on March the 5th, 1770. The first man to die for the revolutionary freedom of our country, to set America free from the British was a black man who fell dead five years before the battle at North Ridge. That was a shot, fire that was heard around the world. In 1888, the Crispus Attucks Monument was unveiled, unveiled in Boston Commons. Attucks was a runaway slave. Described as a mulatto fellow, 27 years of age, six feet, two inches tall, with short curly hair. He was the first of five casualties to die for the freedom of our great nation. I'm headed somewhere. In addition to the Revolutionary War, that shot heard around the world, uh, the phrase became associated with other things. Other historical events, such as the 1914 assassination of Australia's Archduke uh, Franz Ferdinand, which helped trigger World War I, and the 1951 game-winning three-run homer 
by the New York Giants, Bobby Thompson, against the Brooklyn Dodgers. Thanks to Thompson's hit that was called a shot heard around the world, the Giants won the pennant that year. But if that was ever a shot heard around the world, Matthew's gospel describes a big shot heard around the world. In fact, the shot that Matthew describes was prophesied some 740 years before it was fired. For the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3 said, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths in a desert, uh, make straight paths in the desert a highway for our God. That is, make the road smooth. Make it safe for travel. Remove all of the rocks and the debris out of the road. And take all the litter and everything that is unsightly and burn it or bury it because somebody special is about to walk down this road. And the road has to be safe and the travel has to be smooth. It was common uh, in ancient times that when a monarch was about to enter into a city, it was commonplace for a herald to proceed the monarch and announce the monarch's arrival as well as clean up the streets, smooth out the roads, get rid of all of the trash, Make sure that the road is a pretty uh, road and the street is a nice street because somebody special is about to walk down this street. Matthew's Gospel chapter 3 records to me the greatest shot heard around the world. The Bible says in Matthew's Gospel 3 and 1, in those days, came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. In those days. Praise the Lord. And it's funny because this was between Matthew's gospel chapter 2 and verse 23 and Matthew's gospel chapter 3 and verse 1. 30 years had passed. Praise the Lord. Jesus had gone from being the little boy in Nazareth to now he's a grown man ready to start his earthly ministry. His cousin, John the Baptist, had gone from being a little boy to a grown man. The time had come for Jesus to start his earthly ministry and to fulfill his assignment. But this monarch, this king, this messiah, couldn't get started without the proper announcement. The herald had to come and make an announcement that proved to be a shot heard around the world. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. What did he preach? He preached saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Before John came, others had spoken of the kingdom, but they preached the kingdom as a distant thing. The kingdom as something that would come someday. John the Baptist preached that the kingdom is here. He was the first one to preach the kingdom of God as a present thing. Word kingdom of God, the Greek word is Bezalia. And the, the kingdom that John was preaching about was the spiritual kingdom that Jesus came to establish in the heart of every person. 
You see, the Old Testament, the law could teach people how to live. The law uh, was correct in that it laid out the instructions of God. But the law failed in that men could not live up to it. The law could teach it away, but the law couldn't clean your conscience. Jesus came to bring something that would literally get on the inside of you. Praise the Lord. And change you from the inside out. That thing that changes us from the inside out. That Bezalia is God's spiritual kingdom that he establishes in the heart of every true believer. Jesus said in Luke 17 and 21, the B clause, he said, the kingdom of God is within you. Daniel prophesied about this kingdom in Daniel 2 and 44. Daniel said, uh, and in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these other kingdoms. And this kingdom, Daniel says, shall stand forever. John came preaching the kingdom of God. He preached, repent. For the kingdom is at hand. And let me just read this. And, and uh, it's going to get better. The Bible says in verse 3. For this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah. Saying the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Get ready for the coming monarch. Make his, the Lord, make his path straight. That is, clean up the road. Isn't that wonderful? And the same John, this, this preacher, this guy with this unusual message, he not only did he have an unusual message, but he had an unusual look. The Bible says, and this same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leather girdle about his loins and his meat was locusts and wild honey. So this man came with the message preaching that the kingdom of God is at hand. Let me give you this tidbit also while I'm talking about it. Um, when John began to preach, John broke a 400 year silence from Malachi of the Old Testament to Matthew of the New Testament. That's the distance between the two are 400 years. God had not spoken to man since Malachi. There was a 400 year silence until John began to preach. And he began to cry from the wilderness of Judea. Not a fancy message, but a very clear one. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, as he preached, I want to show you something. And, uh, and this will get to my point that uh, God has given me for 2018. Uh, I want us to look at verse 5 through verse 12 and just notice the people's response to John's preaching and John's response to their response. Verse 5, see, because uh, the whole religious world is about to uh, be turned upside down and go into a state of flux. Verse 5 says, then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan. Let me tell you, when this man began to preach, it was, a, it was an incredible thing. People came from at, as walking now from as far away as 60, 70, uh, 80 miles or so. They came from Jerusalem. They came from both sides of the Jordan River. They came from Judea. People came from everywhere to hear this unusual message. 
This man had drawing power. Certainly the power of God was on him. And they came from miles around walking to hear this great preacher. And when they got there, now listen, another little thing. All the people who came to hear him were Jews. This is very important. These were Jews who only knew the law and the Old Testament teachings. And in the law, there was no room for baptisms. The ceremonial washings were the washing of the hands, the washing of the feet, and the washing of the head. There was no uh, ceremonial baptisms. And yet these Jews, when they heard John preach, they had to be uh, convicted by his preaching and uh, for them to allow him to baptize them. Now John was of an aesthetic group called the Essenes. And the Essenes were a, a, a group of priests who lived in the desert. And their, their lives were marked by sacrifice. Now in the Essene movement, they did do uh, a, a act or a ceremony that resembled baptisms, but they baptized all the time. Sometimes the Essenes would get baptized every day. Sometimes the Essenes would be baptized every hour. And each baptism represented being cleansed from sin. But when God got hold to John, what distinguished John's Baptism is that you only had to be baptized one time. Hallelujah. And that one baptism would do it for a lifetime if you were saved when you were baptized. And also that Jews would submit to this baptism. That was their way of saying all that we've known previously is not good enough to save us. We have to give up everything that we know and submit to this baptism baptism to get our sins removed. And can you see this? People came from everywhere and they didn't resist John. They didn't fight John. They, uh, they, this group didn't. And they gave in to John's gospel and they were baptized uh, and cleansed from their sin. Verse 6 says, and were baptized of him in Jordan confessing their sins. What a revival. What a response. What a group of people. But, verse 7, when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, welcome to my baptism. No, he said, oh, generation of snakes. How about that? Isn't that some welcome? Oh, generation of vipers, who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Then he said to them, bring forth therefore fruit, meat for repentance. He said, I don't know who warned you to come, but if you're going to come, come ready to change. If you're going to come, Pharisees, you got to come and be willing to be baptized like everybody else. See, nobody is above God's law. No human being is above God's word. It doesn't matter to, you, me, to me how smart you are. Doesn't matter how much money you have. Doesn't matter your color. It doesn't matter your educational achievements and all of the things that we have that make us think that we are superior. Nobody is above God's word. No one can create their own way of salvation. No man is. It doesn't work that way. You can't make your own religion. You can't say, well, preacher, me and my God. Me and my God, we have an understanding. No, 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 no. If your understanding is not in line with scripture, then you're not serving the God of the Bible. You are serving a God of your imagination. And that little arrangement will not hold up. Every one of us have got to, has got to be willing to submit ourselves to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords. 
Well, I don't care what that preacher says. I'm going to do what I want. But you will have to answer. Not to me. But someday the Bible teaches that every one of us will have to give an account of ourselves to God. Every man will have to give an account of the deeds done in his body. Not only that, but every man must give an account of every idle word that men shall speak. So go on with your bad self. Do it the way you want to do it. But the day will come when, when the, uh, where God will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing. Why the Bible says, uh, hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. When these Pharisees came, John rebuked them. And then he said to them in verse 9, and think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham uh, as our father. That is, we, we have the law. We are, we are Jews. We are sons of Abraham. He says, that doesn't matter. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones out here to raise up children unto Abraham. And then he says this, now is the axe laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit shall be hewed down and cast into the fire. The fire, my friends, is judgment. Then he said this, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. Now follow me. Uh, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. When you look at this in its contextual setting, you do not want the fire. You want the Holy Ghost. What, what John was saying was, for those who accept him, that's one group, the Lord will give them the Holy Ghost. But for those who fight him, notice he mentions fire in verse 10. And the fire is judgment. Those who reject him, what he has for them is fire. He has judgment. For those of us who accept him, what he has for us is the Holy Ghost. You decide in 2018 what you want from the Lord. Do you want the Holy Ghost or do you want fire? Do you want God's blessings or do you want God's judgment? Oh, I can't get an amen in here. You see, there were two groups. Jesus said in Matthew 11, in our text, he says in 11 and verse 12, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence. Let me help you with that. Uh, from the days of John the Baptist, that is not before John came. And the time period, now Pastor Parker, I think you talked about 18 months in your sermon. The time period when Jesus speaks of John in Matthew's gospel, chapter 11. John's ministry lasted for 18 months. Hallelujah. It was an 18-month time period when the Lord says, from the days of John the Baptist until now. Uh, and by the time our Lord said this, John had been arrested. He was in jail, according to Matthew's gospel, chapter 11, verse 2. It says, now when John had heard in prison of the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples. Why was John in prison? John was in prison because John preached the truth. According to Matthew's gospel, chapter 14, you don't mind if we preach the Bible, do you? Uh, the Bible says in chapter 14, at that time, Herod the Tetrach, Herod the fourth ruler of uh, part of Jerusalem, heard of the fame of Jesus and said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead. Herod thought that Jesus was John. And therefore, the mighty works do show forth 
themselves in him. For, verse 3, Herod had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison. For Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. Why did Herodias want John arrested? Why did Herod arrest John? Herod was a governor. Why did this man arrest John for Herodias, Herod's brother, Philip's sake? Here's why. Herod was an immoral man. Herod was dating and had married his brother, Philip's wife. Herodias was married to Philip. Herod was married to someone else. Herod left his wife and Herodias left Philip and married Herod. And when they got married, nobody would preach against it. No one would say anything. They didn't want anyone to point out their sin. Oh my, some of y'all, your body language is making me feel like you're here with your brother, Phillips. <laughs> Why? <laughs> well, some of y'all got tense then. I saw you when you... See, we're in a day now where you, you can't win. You, you preach against sin, now folk fall out with you. They call you judgmental. Uh, one of my friends told me the other day, he said, uh, this guy that works for me, he said, it's fine, man. He said, you know, some of his friends stopped talking to him when they, when they found out that he was working with me. So I asked him, I said, what was that problem with me? I thought it was something there. He said, no, their problem was they just resent you for preaching against homosexuality. They resent you for preaching against perversion. They call you the hateful preacher. Now, that was a time when black folk didn't hate the preacher for preaching against sin, for telling the truth. See, you know, folks say the truth is welcome in heaven. That's, my, that's about to be the only place where it's welcome because it's not welcomed in the heart of people anymore. When you tell the truth, now you accuse of preaching hate. And uh, since when has God's truth been labeled hate? When you tell the truth, now you're accused of being judgmental. And then they throw at you the scripture that says, judge not. Well, the, Jesus was right when he said judge not. But you got to know what judge means. To judge means to come to a conclusion about a person without knowing the facts. If you know the facts and you come to a conclusion, you have not judged him. If the man tell you he's a homosexual and you tell, you tell him he's wrong, you're not wrong because the Bible says that's wrong and I hadn't judged him, God judged him. Man put on a wig, uh, bring me up on my monitors brother. I got the, I got, they gonna make me work this New Year's Eve. Man put on a wig and a dress and pumps and claim that he's a woman and, uh, and you know that that's a man standing there and you don't play the game and you uh, do not call that man a woman but you call that man a man you haven't judged that man that's a man if you don't believe me swab his mouth with a q-tip check his DNA the DNA says man 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 See, we don't have enough John the Baptists. Everybody else was quiet. Same-sex marriage. You know marriage is a union between a man and a woman. We had the definition of marriage is older than this country. The definition of marriage, praise the Lord, predates America. Glory to God. The definition of marriage predates Christianity. The definition of marriage predates Judaism. For before there was any religion, 
The Bible said before there was any religion on this planet, the Bible said that God said it is not good that the man shall be alone. And God, before there was a religion, put Adam to sleep and took a rib from him and made a woman and brought that woman to the man. And when he brought that woman to the man, God said, for this cause, shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and they too shall be one flesh. And now you want me, you want me to go along with two men marrying each other. Never. You want me to go along with two women marrying each other. Never. Because they can't. They can't. They can have a ceremony. They can march down an aisle. They can get a dumb preacher to read some vows. But God said that marriage is a union between a man and a woman. And the last time I checked, God hadn't changed his mind. John the Baptist stepped up when the rest of the Essenes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees said nothing. John told the political man, Herod was the teacher, he was a politician. John, you know, you get separation of church and state. John told the politician, he said, it is not lawful for you to have her, it ain't right for you to have your brother Philip's wife. And when, all right, and when he would have put him to death, oh, Herod wanted to kill him, but the Bible said, but he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. So here's what happened. They had a feast one day. Verse six says, uh, when Herod's birthday was kept, uh, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. Now the phrase pleased Herod was a euphemistic phrase for saying that the girl who was about 12 to 14 years old, uh, she aroused Herod sexually. So now Herodias, Philip's wife, let her 12 to 14 year old daughter do a lap dance for her boyfriend, her, for Herod on his birthday. And here she is with her little girl, 12 to 14, dancing in front of her boyfriend or husband and he's aroused and standing up and she can see that the man is aroused and, and this is the kind of wickedness that was going on in that household and John said something about it. We ain't gonna never stop preaching the truth. Praise the Lord. We always preach the Bible. And John spoke up and so they arrested him and so when, when old Herod was Turned on a pedophile. That's what it was. What kind of grown man, what kind of grown man gets turned on by anybody's 12 year old? Anybody's 14 year old. And then what kind of mother would let her child dance like that? Thank God that John said something. We were wicked, messed up people in power. Wicked and messed up, but still the tea trench. Wicked and immoral, but a government official. God Almighty. But the preacher said what God wanted said. And uh, what they did, while he was uh, aroused, uh, whereupon he promised with an oath. While he was still, the girl still shaking a rump. And he moved by some 12 to 14 year old girl. Her name was Salome. The Bible is something in it. See, some of you didn't even know this was in the Bible. Go home and read it. 
while she was on, he was on fire, he made an oath to give uh, Herodias whatever, uh, and Salome, whatever they asked for. You know, he was thinking, uh, You get the picture. And so, all right, uh, praise the Lord. <laughs> I guess, and the girl said to, in verse eight, and she being instructed of her mother, said, now, when he gets turned on, I know him, you know, just jiggle it. He'll, it'll move him. When he's on, turned on, he'll do anything because his brain shuts down. All the blood rushes somewhere else. So when he's like that, ask him. He's going to, he's going to make a vow to give you whatever you want. Here is what you ask for. Tell him, give me here John the Baptist's head in a charger. That is, kill him right away and surely enough he's sitting there a grown man drooling at a 12 to 14 year old girl with her mother having sent her out there the girl didn't stand a chance this year oh lord help her and uh, uh, he she he says to her whatever you want up to half of my kingdom you can have it she says I want John's head I want the head of John the Baptist. The Bible teaches that afterwards the king was sorry. I guess, I guess after. After that, you know, his sense came back to him. I'm trying to preach. I'm really trying to preach the Bible. You know the Bible is this real, did you? And so you can, you can learn from, all, uh, from the Bible. And so the king was sorry, but nevertheless, he had made an oath and uh, he sent and beheaded John in prison. He decapitated him, which was contrary to the Jewish laws of execution. And he decapitated John without a trial. And according to the, the historian Jerome, that when they brought John's head to uh, Herodias, that she spit on his head and she pierced his tongue. This is how this great man died. And his disciples came and took up the body and buried it. They didn't cremate it. I'll preach to you about that later on. Tell you where that came from. I know it's cheaper. Get some insurance. But it's not the way. It's not the way. It's not the biblical way to, dis to dispose of the remains of a saint. We get that from Hinduism and other Eastern religions. Which teach that when a person dies, the only way the, the spirit can be free from that body is that the body has to be burned. But in Christianity, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And throughout the Bible, it is taught over and over that they died and were buried. And were buried. And were buried. The Bible teaches, and the bodies of those that, that them that slept shall be resurrected. And were buried. Amen. So if, now if you got grandma up, up, up down the, on the mantle in an urn or ashes, <laughs> I guess, you know, too late. So, you know, <laughs> don't do it to grandpa. How about that? <laughs> when is his time? <laughs> Say amen. That's too much like going to hell, too. I'm getting burned up like that. Let me get back to my text. I, I need to pray for you all. So the point is, there were two groups. Amen. 
one group. Matthew speaks of them in chapter 11, verse 12. He says, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence. That is, the kingdom of heaven suffers violent attacks. From the time John began to preach it, there were people who opposed him. There were people who wanted to silence him. There were people, he was opposed by zealots and Pharisees and evil spirits and their human hosts. He was opposed, he was opposed by Jewish antagonists, by false doctrines, by homosexualisms, by postmodernism, by modernism, by all kinds of conflicting ideologies. They tried to stop John. They tried to stamp out the message. They hated John and his message. That's one group. Praise the Lord. And uh, Matthew chapter 11, verse 12, the second part of verse 12, speaks of another group. The second group says, he says, and the violent taketh it by force. That's where our text come from. That says every man, Luke 16 and 16, presseth into it. See, the true believer do not fight God's truth. But the true believer grabs hold to. The true believer, when they hear the truth of God, the most dangerous place you can be in is a stand between a true believer and the Lord. Because that true believer is going to get to God. One way or the other. The true believer recognizes the value of the kingdom. He recognizes his soul that he won't let mama keep him out of it. She won't let daddy keep her away from it. The true believer, if she gets saved and her husband just don't want it, she'll still love that man. But she won't let that man keep her from going to church and serving the Lord because the true believer recognizes the value of serving God and the true believer uh, presses into it and the word press there press press it literally means to overpower to press one's way in with energy I'm not going the way of this world where we keep cutting down service and shortening our time with God. Instead, I'm pressing my way into this thing because I recognize the value of this. Do I have anybody here who recognize the value of what God is doing? It says to press oneself in with energy. The Holman Christian Study Bible says everyone is strongly urged to enter into it. Another translation says everyone crowding into it. Another translation says everyone has been storming their way into it. What is my point? In 2018, there'll be two groups. All oh, the world is going to continue to try to stamp out biblical Christianity. Uh -huh. uh, CNN at Christmas time ran a few shows showing how racist people use Christianity to enslave black folk. And I said to myself, no wonder they call CNN fake news. What a disrespectful thing for CNN to do right here at Christmas time. You're going to run a piece like that knowing that it's designed to race bait. Why not run a piece, CNN, that showed that the first people to build hospitals were Christians? Why not run a piece, CNN, that showed that the abolitionists who fought to end slavery was all driven by Christianity. Good God Almighty, why not CNN run pieces to show that all of the major universities in this country were built by Christians and that the mother of all religion 
is the Bible because the reason that America set up an educational system in the first place was so that the students could learn to read the Bible. Why not, praise the Lord, uh, talk about all of the good things that Christians have done down through the years to help people and to reach people and how Christians have lost their lives uh, saving people from disasters but instead they run a peace that's designed to put Christianity in a negative light they would have never done that during Ramadan well they wouldn't do that to Islam at any time they won't do it to Buddhism they won't talk about all of the murderous things that Muhammad did and all them little children he was a pedophile all them kids that he were with they'll never run a piece like that but the world is always trying to discredit Christianity let a Christian mess up let a Christian get caught in immorality and it's plastered all over the news but if a punk get caught being a punk they bury the story good God almighty the world is trying to stamp this thing out they're trying praise the Lord to show it in a negative light but I'm here to tell you that's one group but there's another group of people who are excited about what God is doing there's another group of people who says I've got to be a part of this I want the Lord on the inside of me I want to be a part of the last day move of God let me prophesy in 2018 the battle will be on but I wonder tonight how many will sign up to be on the Lord's side how many will sign up and say I don't care hallelujah if shows like the voice come knocking notice every time you turn around uh, that some uh, praise and worship leader going on that worldly show selling out if I never get famous if I never get a Grammy if I never sell a record I would never sell out to that mess because it's, it's worth having the Lord on the inside I wonder how many would, would turn the world down tell the world you can have it I want Jesus in my heart as never before because I know that heaven and earth shall pass away but the word of God will stand forever. I'm come to tell you tonight that there is nothing as important as the kingdom of God. And I'm gonna press my way into it. Jesus spoke of the attributes of the kingdom. He said in the kingdom, the blind receive their sight. The lame go to walking. The lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised up. And the poor has the gospel preached unto them. In the kingdom, you can be healed. In the kingdom, you can have joy. In the kingdom, you can be delivered. I'm so glad that I'm in the kingdom of God. I'm glad that I'm saved like the Bible said. And I wonder, do I have 10 people in here who will declare that I wouldn't trade him for nothing? I wouldn't give it up for a Grammy. I wouldn't give it up for an Oscar. I wouldn't give it up for anything that the world has to offer. I'm glad to be on the Lord's side. If this is your thinking, lift your hands and give him praise. I'm, and while you're praising him, tell the Lord, Lord, I'm in group two. Yes, sir. I'm not in the group. 
in group one. They're trying to stamp it out. I'm in group two. I'm going to shout it out. Group one, they're trying to kill it. But group two, we're going to promote it. We're going to tell the world that there's nobody like Jesus. If you believe like I do, lift your hands and give him praise. Hey! Give him praise in the building. Hey! Shake somebody's hand tonight and tell them I love this. If you're saved, tell them I love this. I love being saved. I love being washed in the blood of the Lamb. Whoa! I love how many love it tonight. I just want those who love it to praise the Lord. Somebody declare with me, I am, I'm a presser. I'm pressing, I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights. I'm gaining every day, still praying as I'm homeward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Yeah, yeah, Lord. Lord, lift me up and let me stand. My faith on heaven's table land. Still praying as I'm homeward bound. Plant my feet on higher ground. Tell him, yeah, yeah. Oh, Lord, I can't wait. I can't wait to take my stand. I can't wait to tell the world. God bless you, preacher, in 2018 that he's a He's real, he's real, and I trust God. I trust him, I trust him with all of it. I trust him with creation. I don't believe in no big bang. I trust God, I trust him with marriage. I believe he knew what he was saying. I trust God, I trust him with sexuality. He's right, I trust God. I believe that life begins at conception. Ain't that what David said? The Bible is right, I trust God. If you put him first, all these things will be added unto you. In 2018, we got to make our stand. But if you make your stand, you're going to see something. If you take your stand, you're going to see the glory of God like you've never seen it before. Because I'm telling you right now, he's going to move by his spirit. He's going to heal because he's a healer. He's going to make ways. He's a way maker. He's going to lift up. He's going to break yokes. He's going to do some mighty things. But you got to stand. And when the enemy is trying to wear you down, just remember that I told you, be not weary in well-doing, for you shall reap in due season if you faint not if you don't faint the Lord's gonna come through and the Lord's going to bless you somebody say yeah how many presses do I have in here tonight Lord anoint me to press my way into it I see the value of it I see it's worth and I'm gonna do this thing Lift your hands all over, all over. Time out. Hain 
music and you prayed tonight, man. Time out for singers who sing with no joy. Time out for preachers who preach with no passion. Time out for churchgoers who show up like you're doing God a favor. Time out for so-called believers who compromise at work and won't make a stand. Time out. Yeah. Time out. Mm -hmm. At work, all they're doing is criticizing Christians. Christians aren't this and Christians aren't that and this is what's wrong with Christianity and Christianity is not this and you standing there won't say anything. Let him try around the man. I got something to say. What you got to say preacher? On a hill fireway stood it on rugged cross lift your hands somebody it was the emblem of suffering and shame and I love that cross where the dearest and the best for a world of lost sinners was slain how many love the Lord tonight how many are glad to be saved I'm so glad to be in this. I don't know what the future holds, but I know this, whatever the future holds, what's not in my future is separation from the Lord Jesus Christ. No, sir. Now, that ain't happening. He's already promised that he will never leave me. Well, I'm promising him that I'm not leaving him. He's, and you know what he is? He's a keeper. You might stumble and fall, but he'll give you power to get back up again. He's a keeper. Ah, yes, he is. Look at your neighbor and say, won't he keep you? Nobody's perfect. All have fallen. The Bible says, hallelujah, that a good man uh, delighteth his way in the Lord, but though he fall, the Lord will uphold him. David made a lot of errors in his life, but he never served another God. He never served Baal. He never served Ashtaroth. He never served Malcolm. And God said this about David. David didn't say this about himself because he couldn't. But God said this about David. With all of his shortcomings, he was a man after my own heart. What does that phrase mean? That phrase is a comment uh, about how God felt about David, but it's also a comment about how David felt about God. David was after the heart of God. Who wants the heart of God? In 2018, how bad do you want the heart of God? We will be tested because the world will make you an offer to see what you will do. And some of our friends are so carnal. You know they're carnal when they start out with honey child if it was me. A spiritual friend starts out with the Bible say. See because it's not you. Two groups, I'm done. I'm getting ready to pray. Two groups. One group tried to stamp it out. Oh my Lord, the media is in on it. 
Politicians are in on it. All Hollywood's in on it. At least every major motion picture, it's not by mistake, in every major motion picture you go to the movies to see, at some point in the movie, in the succession of at least four times, they take the Lord's name in vain. Some, some form of Jesus Christ, Jesus H Christ, Jesus F Christ, Jesus Christ. That's by design. That is taking the Lord's name in vain. That is their way of cursing Christ. I know it's a conspiracy because all of them do it. It's designed to take the sweetest name we know and the most powerful name in existence for there is no other name the Bible says under heaven given among men whereby we might be saved and take that name and just reduce it down to a mere curse word and now you even hear Christians using the name Jesus as a figure of expression oh Jesus that was not you're not supposed to do that you're never supposed to use his name unintentionally it's never to be used without thought it's never to be used lightly it's to be reserved for when it's time to talk to him or to share him with others or to give him praise but never as an expression oh Jesus I'm glad to see y'all that's cussing that is violating thou shall not use the Lord's name in vain that name is precious it's the sweetest name I know so in 2018 they're going to step step up step up the attack on biblical Christianity you'll see you'll see part of it is how they just bent over backwards to not say Merry Christmas at Christmas time to, to make Thanksgiving Turkey Day to, to make Easter uh